starting this, the, the text, a song of the stages of the part of enlightenment, Namrim Nyamgur, by Lama Tsungapa. Um, a certain problem elevation which consists of three parts. One, the <coughs> refuge field, what to visualize and how to visualize. What to visualize, Bodhisattva Money, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and all the Buddhist Bodhisattvas, particularly Aramaji Sri, Aramatriya, Aramaru Tishvara, Aratara, Aramajapani, then Aramigarjana. Hare Dev, Buddha Padita, Ashura Chandra Kriti, Borisata Chandra Rakshita, Borisata Chandra Dev, Atishita Kamara Shri Jnana, and the author of the text which we are going to study for the next few Fridays, um, Lama Tsongkhapa. And how you visualize that? Next point. They are like your very affectionate grandparents. And you are the child coming home demoralized, being bullied by elder children in the school. And your parents are there to give you full love, affection, attention, and praise. Next, we put it in the field. What to visualize and how to visualize. Again, the same thing. You have two grandparents on the two sides, all of the Emerson Chimbangs, all of the members, and all the Emerson Chimbangs, including tiny insects, animals, the non humans, like the spirits, the gods, goddesses, and so forth. And how you visualize them? Here, you are the mother, and all others are like your children. Imagine that they come home demoralized. And you are there as the very affectionate mother to give full love, affection, attention, and so forth, to the extent that each one of them feels themselves as so special in their eyes. And the purpose of this class is to discover the ultimate source of happiness which exists within each one of us, which is temporarily obscured by the mental departments. The cross developments consisting of the afflictive obscurations and the subtle one referred to as the cognitive obscurations. Cross one, afflictive obscurations, which, uh, which is further really consisted of afflictions and their corresponding Gautamani karmas, which all are rooted to the self ignorance and the subtle stains. And the presence of these afflictive obscurations obscure us from achieving total enlightenment. So the personal, the freedom from samsara and the subtle stains in the form of our cognitive obscurations, they obscure us from achieving total enlightenment. So how to, how to cleanse the mind of these mental departments so that the true nature, the true perfect Pressure of enlightenment which exists within each one of us to be manifest how to make it happen is by resorting to their respective remedies, respective the antidotes. And for the afflictive obscurations, given that they are all rooted to self grasping ignorance, it is the wisdom of emptiness and driven by the force of renunciation. And the cognitive obscurations, again, the wisdom of emptiness driven by the fossil of altruistic intention of bodhicitta. So in other words, the practice of renunciation, the practice of bodhicitta, and the practice of the wisdom of emptiness, that with these three we can expect to cleanse our mind fully, and then we discover the ultimate source of happiness where we are not being affected, we are not going to be affected by the, the any kind of external factors, and afflictions. <coughs> okay, with that in mind, imagine the awesome she makes that joining us, and you are leading this. Uh, let's turn to page two. 
and tears by great compassion, you taught the Merkle Dharma to dispel all perverted views, to heal the Buddha Gudama I pure homage. And tears by great compassion, you taught the Merkle Dharma to dispel all perverted views, to heal the Buddha Gudama I pure homage. And tears by great compassion, you taught the Merkle Dharma to dispel all perverted views, to heal the Buddha Gudama I pure homage. In dependent origination, there is no ceasing, no arising, no annihilation, no permanence, no coming, no going, no separateness and no sameness. I prostrate to the consummate Buddha, the supreme among all teachers, the one who taught this peace, which is free of elaborations. I prostrate to the mothers of the Buddhas and of the hearers and Bodhisattvas, who through the knowledge of all these hearers seek in pacification to complete peace, who through the knowledge of past causes of having my greatest to achieve the aims of the world, and through the possession of nations, the subdued is set for the varieties in all aspects. The one who is transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teachers who guard and protect her to your administrations, the one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and is endowed with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, eternally shines forth the forever noble light rays to you, the Buddha, administrations. P7. From the bottom, I go for a few gentle and enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations to the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for a few gentle and enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations to the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for a few gentle and enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye Jodha Zoghe Chonam Da Chanju Bhardo Dane Kyapsoj Tage Jin Zoghe Ve Zonam Ge Jola Benjir Sangye Do Bharai Shor Sangye Jodha Zoghe Chonam Da Chanju Bhardo Dane Kyapsoj Tage Jin Zoghe Ve Zonam Ge Kola Benjira Sangye Jho Bara Isho Sangye Chita Soge Isho Nam Chanjo Bardo Dane Gyal Soge Dage Jin Soge Be Tso Nam Ge Kola Benjira Sangye Jho Bara Isho All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. A cessation of causes as well as taught by the Great Seer. Om Ye Dharana Heto Prabhava Hetum Te Shantata Gato Yavata Te Sham Jayo Niroda Evam Vati Mahashramana Yeswa This is very precious mantra, and eventually when we study the ultimate reality emptiness, we will see how meaningful, how so blessed that we are to meet with such a powerful uh, mantra. And uh, this mantra is talking about the cleansing of our mind, the internal journey, the journey to cleanse the mind. Um, same. Diyatha, Diyatha means here, here is thus 
Om Gati Gati Om symbolizing the body, speech, and mind of the unenlightened being. Like us, with ordinary beings. Uh, but what we have, what we really have is the body, speech, and mind. Say when we move, it is a physical body which is moving. And when we, when we converse with other people, it is a speech which converse with the other people. And then when we feel happy, when we feel unhappy, when we feel agitated, there's all the mental experiences, mind. So we, what we see is then, just examine this in our life. Say, the morning we you know, put the wake up, so the, the, the night we go to sleep, and then in, even in the sleep, in the dreams, we see that finally we have what we have is the physical body, our speech, and the mind. These are three things which we employ, and this they this we really embody who we are. So here we're saying the, the the journey is the journey of the the internal mind. So the journey to purify, to cleanse the physical, the verbal, and the mental. So what we have, OM, which is indicated by the syllable OM, this syllable which consists of three parts, are OM, the three letters, they symbolize the body, speech, mind that we have, and also the body, speech, mind that the enlightened beings have. Enlightened beings. In other words, in other words, when we become enlightened, then our body, speech, and mind, they become enlightened, the body, speech, mind. When we are unenlightened, what really make us unenlightened is that our body, speech, mind, these two are unenlightened. So, this, when we recite this syllable, when we utter this syllable, oh, this is something which is common to Buddhism and Hinduism. The syllable Om oh, is common to Buddhism and Hinduism. And this is what we need to keep in mind of the meaning. Of course, the syllable Om oh, has so many meanings, so many meanings. One which is directly related to our spiritual journey is the cleansing of the body speech mind that we have into the enlightened body speech mind. Okay, with this, the next question is how to go about transforming this body speech mind that we have to an enlightened one. So then, the actual journey starts. Journey of journey from the impure state to the perfect pure state. So this journey. Is consisted of three part, the five parts: gati, gati, para gati, para sam gati, bodhi, swaha, These five parts. So it's not just a random selection of words. It's not a random selection of words. They are um, the each of these words: gati, 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 second gati, para gati, para sam gati, bodhi, swaha. Each of these words they symbolize the five steps towards perfection. Okay, so um, to go into detail, so this is the very comprehensive, complete form of the cleansing of the mind, complete form of the spirituality. It involves psychology, it involves philosophy, it involves say, metaphysics, it, in, it involves epistemology and so forth. Um, it requires a lot of the, the studies, and particularly the text which we are to study from today um, for the Friday classes. Is precisely to explain um, what this mean, the, what the meaning of this mantra is all about. Okay, so with this, and now the actual, the what we need to keep in mind is when we speak about the journey. When we speak about the journey, there should be two things. One is what actually takes us, moves us, moves us. What actually moves us, one. And then number two is the energy to move us. There should be two things: energy to move us. And what actually moves us there? Say, for example, um, say if somebody is to if somebody is to uh, study in the school, then the colleges, and then in the universities. So we are going through these different phases. We are going through these different phases. So what really makes somebody to move from one step from the school to the college to the university? This is your knowledge. Your knowledge. Takes you, upgrades you from the various, from the, the the earlier levels to the later, the to the later levels. But there must be the enthusiasm, not only the knowledge, but there must be the enthusiasm for one, 
Otherwise, somebody may be very intelligent, so intelligent, but the person may do the undergrad and then stop, drop there, or may do the masters and drop. May not be keen to uh, do a fill PhD. Without such enthusiasm, how can you possibly expect to finish these higher levels of the studies? So therefore, one is the knowledge is required, and the other one is the, the drive, the enthusiasm to to complete that journey. The two things are required. So this journey, gate gate, para gate, para sangate, is the journey of the cleansing of the mind. And the most difficult journey is the journey of cleansing of the mind. This is the most difficult journey. However, arduous the journey may be of the external, the, the journey, but in actuality, the more difficult than the external journey is the internal journey of cleansing the mind. So for this, we need one, the knowledge to undertake the journey. That knowledge is the knowledge of the wisdom of wisdom, which sees the reality, which sees the ultimate reality. And then with this knowledge, you must have the enthusiasm to get the ear. Enthusiasm to cleanse your mind fully, so that you become enlightened. When you become enlightened, then you are in a position to benefit all sentient beings. The mother of this present life, the mother of the, the earlier life, and of the, all the other the beings who have been so kind to you. <clears throat> so for this we see that to undertake this journey, we need two things. One is the altruistic, the motivation of the altruistic bodhicitta, and the other is the wisdom to see the reality. The two things are required. So, those of us who are here, who are exposed to the, say, the practice of unconditional love, unconditional love of bodhicitta for all beings, try to invoke the spirit of the unconditional love to us all beings. And then meanwhile, what actually takes us, upgrades us from one level to the next, gade, gade, para gade, so that is by the wisdom, the wisdom of emptiness. So those of us who have some exposure to this emptiness, it is very important for us to to rec recall, recall the experience of emptiness once in a while as precise this mantra. So this is how we should be Sadhana Mantra, imagine that because that this mantra is so precious, this mantra is so precious, this mantra is so precious, why not we uh, make a point that our parents also get a share of this. Likewise, all of family members and all the other sentient beings, they get a share of this restoration mantra. So for this matter, we can visualize your two parents and everyone happily joining you in this recitation mantra by following the internal journey of cleansing the mind. Okay, and you, you listen this. With this mind, let us say, let us say this mantra seven times together. <coughs> <coughs> Oh, 
emphasize on the need for need for say the concentration concentration the meditative concentration so in this regard that is something which is um, very common um, more like secular in nature of the breathing meditation so this meditation um, it will be extremely good for building your single pointedness the power of single point the focus um, and at times when you go through, say, mental stress, anxiety, and so forth, uh, then if you do this meditation, the breath meditation, we see that it is extremely beneficial. Say, when somebody is a little stress or a little bit anxiety, or say, in the burnout cases, and so forth, what is really happening is that the mind gets agitated mind gets agitated. So with this meditation what happens is the mind is instantly settled. As the mind is settled, the mind and the energy, these two are very closely connected. Very closely connected. And particularly in the context of Tantra, we see that mind and the subtle energy, these two are actually the two sides of the same coin. The mind and the subtle energy, these two are the two sides of the same coin. As you control the mind, the energy is automatically controlled. And as you control the energy, the mind is automatically controlled. So this is what is happening. This is what is happening. 
um, the, uh, due to the relationship between the, the mind and the energy. Okay, so there we see that with this med single point of meditation, as we the as we see that you focus on mind single pointedly, then the mind gets settled. As the mind gets settled, automatically the energy is also under control. Energy under control. As the energy becomes smooth, then the agitation subsides. So this meditation is extremely helpful for uh, for all of us, uh, particularly. Um, the, the context of one, building your concentration, building concentration, and number two is in the concept of in the context of subduing your mind and calming your mind, um, the bringing your mind to peace. Okay, so this practice has four main things to keep in mind: one is body posture, and number two is the focal point, number three is identifying the errors of meditation. Number four is applying the remedies. There are four things to be kept in mind. The first one, body posture. Body posture, of course, for the body posture of meditation, what finally meditates is your mind. Your mind meditates, but the body posture, because the body, the body is connected with the energy. The body is the container of the energy, and depending on how you keep your body, energy moves accordingly. And as depending on how your energy moves, the mind moves. So these two are very closely connected. So for that purpose, particularly for the beginners like us, it is very important to, to focus or the emphasis the, the emphasize on the proper body uh, the proper body posture. Whereas when meditation when you become a great expert in, in meditation and then say the control of energy, control of the mind, you can become independent of the external body, you can gain tremendous command over your energy, tremendous command over your <coughs> the mind, the external body doesn't really affect as much. So that is at a very later stage, not at this moment. So at this moment, it is so important to be careful with the physical body, physical body posture. So for the body posture, one is the cross leg position, and particularly people who are more keen to do the meditation on a daily basis, it is advisable to always learn how to sit cross-legged. Cross-legged meaning, say your left foot on your right leg and the, the right foot on your left leg. So this is the position how the Buddha and the, the past enlightened beings, the Munis, or the Buddhists, Hindus, they all sit in this position. One. Number two is the, the body should be upright. But if you find it difficult, if you find difficult sitting cross legged don't force yourself. Don't force yourself. And particularly if you have knee problems. If you have knee problems, if you have um, a spinal cord, the spine problem and so forth, then don't push yourself to sit the to sit cross legged It can it can really hurt you. Whereas if you don't have these problems and then sitting cross legged is a little difficult, particularly if someone is really I say the um, overweight, then sitting cross leg may be a little problematic. But what I would say is that that um, you can learn this. You can learn this. It's not a difficult thing. You can learn this. What? Now the so cross leg position. Then the body upright, sitting body upright. The body um, always don't bend your body. Always don't bend your body. Sit. Bend, bend your body like this, never. Always learn how to sit upright. Even when you are not meditating, even when you are not meditating, see if you can sit upright. And again, as I said earlier, um, this is meant for people who don't have any back ache problem. If you have back ache problem, um, is a, 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 the is an exception. It's an exception, you do it for yourself. And otherwise, if you have no problem, then learn how not to lean against lean against the support. See how um, how you can do your meditation without leaning against the support. So this is very important. And as I said earlier, um, always try to make it a habit to keep your body always upright. And for the the, the people who are more exposed to yoga, like Radhikaji, so they they know how to sit, right? The, the body body position always upright. Which one? While your body is upright, 
on once in a while, once in a while, keep track of your body to see that your body is not rigid. It should be flexible, it should not be rigid. Particularly as beginners, someone who is a beginner in a time of meditation, there is a tendency that when you keep your body upright, you tend to slowly make your body become stiff. This is a possibility. So once you get tuned to this practice, then you don't have to, you don't have to really um, see whether your body is stiff. And so naturally, you learn and it becomes a habit to keep your body very flexible. Then number three is your head tilted forward a little bit, not too upright, but a little forward a little bit, for a little bit. And then your eyes, this is so important. Eyes not closed. Eyes not closed. If there is somebody who learn meditation with the eyes closed, if a teacher has given an instruction to do meditation with eyes closed, then what I would suggest is that that meditation you do it with eyes closed. Otherwise, you do it eyes open. This is so important. This is so important. And eventually, you will come to learn how important it is. And um, and also, if you learn, if you learn how to do meditation with eyes, meditation with eyes closed or eyes open, then to do with do meditation with eyes closed is very easy. Whereas to do the meditation with the eyes closed all the time and attempt to do with the eyes open is very difficult. So therefore, why not we learn something which is more difficult and it's and at the same time suffices suffices the training of the the meditation with the eyes closed as well, meaning that if you learn how to do meditation with the eyes open, automatically meditation do meditation with the eyes closed is very easy. Okay, so the uh, what I'm suggesting here is learn how. Let us try um, to do meditation with the eyes open. That is half open, half open, 45 degrees cast down. Okay, and then the tongue of tip of the tongue should touch the upper palate tip of the tongue should touch the upper palate to avoid excessive accumulation of saliva in your mouth during meditation. But it is really disturbing the meditation. It does not mean that if you keep your if you if you touch if you keep your tip of the tongue touching the upper palate, it does not mean the saliva will not will not be accumulated at all. This is not the case. But accumulation is going to be much less. Okay. And then the, the teeth and the lips Keep in the natural course and breathe naturally. Don't impose your breath. And put your right hand over your left hand. Hand gesture. There are so many kinds of hand gestures. One which is very common among the same the Buddhist, Hindus, Jains, particularly these three traditions. These tradi traditions, the hand gesture of the there are so many gestures. Within Buddhism, there are so many. Within Hinduism, there are so many gestures. But one which is common to all the traditions is the right hand placed on the left hand and the tips of the two thumbs joining, forming a triangle, and place the two hands in your on your lap, on your lap, the, the, the inner restful state. So this is the body posture, the common hand gesture, a common hand gesture. As I said earlier, there are so many kinds, so many kinds. Okay, so this is the body posture. Number two is the focal point, what we're going to meditate on. There are so many kinds of meditation. Um, meditation on the same ultimate reality, meditation on the uh, say, compassion, meditation on, let's uh, say, the internal vital organs internal vital organs, then meditation on the visualized objects, meditation on the breath, that's so within the meditation of breath, again there's so many varieties. What we're going to do here is one which is pretty simple as well as very beneficial. So that is for this of the 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 focal point is the a very tiny dot, tiny spherical dot, tiny circular dot or spherical dot of uh, 1 mm or 2 mm in diameter between your nose and upper lip. At this position, you're going to focus on a spherical dot, 1 mm or 2 mm in diameter, white in, white in color, 
radiating, radiating one color. So while you focus your mind there, multitasking, multitasking, which is to count your breath. As you focus your mind there, between your nose and upper lip, you also count your breath. Breath in, breath out. Cycle one, breath in, breath out. Cycle two. So this is what I'm going to do for five minutes. So ideally, ideally those of, those of us here who are doing meditation for the first time, it would be good if you can do the meditation with saying, instead of four five minutes, if you can do just 21 cycles <coughs> in one go, 21 cycles, then keep a gap, like to say five, 10 seconds, and again another 21 cycles, you can do this like, say, <coughs> three sets of 21 cycles. Uh, why we are doing five minutes here is because amongst, he, amongst us here, there are people who are already very familiar with meditation. So to make sure that they don't feel bored, uh, we make it five minutes. Otherwise, for the individuals who are doing this for the first time, um, it's highly recommendable that you do it for um, not for like five minutes in, initially. Have it do it, say, with more sessions, shorter duration, shorter duration, and more sessions. So 21 cycles is going to be like like a little over one minute, a little over one minute. And then as this practice becomes more stable, then you can uh, extend it for five minutes, for some time, five minutes, for about like few weeks or one month and so forth. And then you can extend it further, like 10 minutes, 20, 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, and then eventually like one hour two hours and so forth, okay. So this is the focal point. Now number three and number four, these two are extremely important. Number three is identifying the errors of meditation. What could, what could be the potential errors that we can end up, end up with as we do the meditation? So there are two potential errors. One is mental excitement and the other one is mental laxity. Mental excitement is when your mind becomes distracted when a mind is distracted, when a mind is taken away from the object of meditation and gets distracted elsewhere. So this is one error. And the other error is, is opposite of this, which is mental laxity. Heaviness of the mind, the mind becomes lethargic, mind, be mind becomes inservicible, mind becomes sleepy, mind becomes, say, very passive and heavy. So this is mental laxity. So these are the, the two errors. One is mental excitement, where the mind is too excited, mind is scattered, and the other mind becomes too heavy and the legs. So these are the two errors. Number four, applying remedies. This is so important. Oftentimes people do some meditation and they see that that they are not at all they are not at all guarding their mind from these two errors. So it's simply they let go of the mind wherever um, it goes. This is totally erroneous meditation. It is very important, however, the duration is not important. Quantity is not important. Quality is important. Quality. So the quality means a meditation where you do the best you can that the mind, your meditation is free of the two errors. Okay, the next point, how to get rid of the two errors, how to apply the, the remedies to overcome the two errors. So the remedies, they have twofold. One is introspection and the other one is mindfulness. Introspection is like keeping an eye on your mind. Say if you have a pet dog and you lost a pet dog, what do you do? So you go in search of the pet dog. This is introspection. Your mind is like a pet dog. It does not stay on the, the focus and then it gets scattered here and there, or it starts slipping. So this is where the bad dog is lost. So with this, you go in search of this bad dog like the mind. Go in search of this, and finally you see that your mind is distracted, or that you see that your mind is in a lax state. This is where the job of the introspection is done. Now once you find your dog, what you do is that you tie the dog with the rope and bring it home and tie it to the pillar of the home. Likewise, once you find the, the dog like the, the, the mind, pet dog like the mind, distracted or in relaxed state, then you apply the rope, rope like mindfulness. The next remedy is mindfulness. Rope like mindfulness. With this mindfulness, you bring the mind back to the intended object of the meditation. 
See, these are the four points that we need to keep in mind as we do the meditation. Okay, so four minutes, the five minutes. Are you ready?
Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Today, the, the text which we're going to study is on page 178. One? 178. Page 178. This text, a song of the stages of the path to enlightenment. This, this was authored by a 14th century, incredibly great Tibetan Saint scholar, Lama Tsongkhapa. Lama Tsongkhapa, as you can see there, Lama Tsongkhapa is a 14th century great Saint scholar. And um, in the history of Tibet, in the history of Tibet, um, there were two main philosophers, come practitioners, who made the greatest, who made the greatest contribution in the literary world of Tibet. One is Lama Tsongkhapa, and in fact, before him was Sakya Pandita. Sakya Pandita, in I think 12th or 13th century. 12th or 13th century, Sakya Pandita, and then in 14th century, Lama Tsongkhapa. And of course, there were so many other uh, literary giants, the Tibetan literary giants, but two of them, they were the most, they, they, these two were the most acclaimed, the literary giants of the, in the history of the Tibetan the, the literature. And um, this teaching, the song of the stages of the part of enlightenment, song stages, and that how it originated. So as we read the text, we see that, uh, you see that the whole, the account, the, the narration of the chronological evolution of the, the text uh, will be seen there. Um, this, the genre of this, this, the whole genre of this, of the Text is known as Lamre. Lamre. Lam means the path. Lam means in Tibetan. This is a Tibetan word. Lamre. Lam is the path, and Rim is the, the stage or the stages. The stages of meditation. The stages of the path. The stages of the path. And how this came to be? In fact, the whole Buddhism in Tibet. Whole Buddhism in Tibet. Uh, of course, everybody knows that. It uh, came from India. It came from India. Uh, precisely um, started in the 7th century. 7th century, the great Tibetan emperor, King Song Sen Kambu, um, he sent his minister, the, one, the, the, the brightest minister, one of the brightest ministers, uh, to Mesa Buddha, to India, not only to learn Buddhism, not only to learn Buddhist philosophy, but also to, but also to um, invent script, invent Tibetan script so that the, the treasures, the treasures from India in the form of the literary, the, the works can be translated into Tibetan literature. So this was, with this intention, the whole the, the Tibetan script was invented in the 7th century AD, in the 7th century AD. Um, it was believed that pre pre seventh century, before seventh century, there already existed a Tibetan, Tibetan, Tibetan scripts. There was a belief known as the the native. The, there is a native Tibetan religion, and not Buddhism. There is a native Tibetan religion which is known as Pun religion. Pun religion is a native Tibetan religion. So earlier. That, that took the form more as a shamanism, more as a shamanism. The Pan religion took more as a shamanism. And we, we never know exactly, we never know exactly um, how the, the change came into being, how the evolution came into being in this, the native Tibetan religion, Pan religion. So now we see that that this Pan religion is so rich, so sophisticated. It existed now. 
See, there are several centers, there are several main centers, one of which is in Shimla. In Solon, in Shimla, you go there, you see that it's so rich philosophy, psychology, logic, metaphysics, whatever we have in Buddhism, you all see them available there in Pun religion as well. Very similar. So now we never know. We have to, if somebody to do some research as to whether or not these existed pre Buddhism in Tibet or they existed before that. Whether or not they existed before that, this is a question. So, what this case today is so rich, and particularly about empty and so on, is as though like the two are the twins, more than twins, like identical. Uh, this is right. But the point is that the no doubt what happened was that in 7th century AD, the Tibetan great king, Song Zin Gambu, he was more influenced uh, through his two wives. Uh, two wives, one from China and one from Nepal. And both of them were connected with Buddhism. And naturally, the king also was greatly influenced by Buddhism to the extent that he sent his very bright uh, the the young men and particularly his the the minister to Miss Buddha to India to learn Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, all the Buddhist culture there and further to invent uh, Tibetan scripts. So the, the all the Tibetan script now which which we use now for example like say what we have here, say like this the script here, which the folio, small folio, the script which we use, they are all the, the one which was invented by the Tibetan, great Tibetan minister, Tumi Samputa, a very young, bright scholar, and who did so under the auspices and the instruction of the king, King Song Singh. Very often in this book, I hear also the second uh, stanza, Manjushiri is addressed to whom? Okay, I'll explain this. Okay. Yeah, okay. So now with this, um, the King Song Zeng Rappu, and then the in the eighth century, in the eighth century, in the seventh century, King Song Zeng Rappu, Buddhism was imported, imported to Tibet. Then the eighth century, Buddhism started to take root in Tibet. Started to take root in Tibet. This was all because of the, the the great, great, great contribution made by the Indian master, the, the great Bodhisattva Shandar Rakshita in the 8th century AD. Bodhisattva Shandar Rakshita. He made such a great, immense contribution. So should be in one of these numbers, should be there. The, the great saint, the great abbot, referred to as the great abbot, also referred to as the Bodhisattva Shamrakshita. He made an immense contribution. And then when he started to let Buddhism take root in Tibet, and there were so many antagonisms or say the obstacles imposed by the, the opposing forces, and because of which then Guru Padmasambhava Guru Rinpoche, Guru Padma Sambhava was invited because Guru Padma Sambhava, he was more into Tantra. So he was invited to subdue the counter forces, the, the evil forces. So Guru Padma Sambhava take the main responsibility to let the Tantra Buddhism spread in Tibet, meanwhile subduing the negative forces, evil forces, hindering um, the Buddhism from taking root in Tibet. And then we have Bodhisattva Shandarakshita, who was taking the main responsibility to make sure that the, the, the Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist psychology, and the, the monasticism, all these take root in Tibet. So two of them were extremely kind to the Tibetan Buddhism to flourish. Now today, what will we, what is left today, particularly, say, the Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism, I don't know how many of you know that Buddhism can be classified in two in today's context, like Theravada Buddhism and the Mahayana Buddhism. And nowadays, um, His Holiness prefers to call this as a, 
um, Buddhism in the Pali tradition and Buddhism in Sanskrit tradition to make sure that that this is more precisely understood. Because to understand Buddhism in the form of Theravada and Mahayana, we need to know so much of background after this. Okay, this I will skip a little bit. Um, now we see that the the of the Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism which currently exists, which currently exists, Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism which currently exists, we see that it is of two traditions, Chinese tradition and the Tibetan tradition. Both and both came from Nalanda, both came from India. Both came from India. So in third century AD, in third century AD, the Chinese masters they came to India to learn Buddhism and they stayed for about like say, some of them stayed for about lived for about like six, eight years, then put so much effort to learn Buddhism, philosophy, psychology, practice and so forth. And then they took you say the scriptures and so forth to establish Buddhism in China. In in faces, in faces. For example, one of the greatest contributors was the Xuanzang. Xuanzang, who is very popular, Xuanzang. And then that was in the 3rd, 4th century AD. And there was a gap of like 300 years. Then in 7th century, 8th century, then Buddhism was imported from India to Tibet directly, not from China. From India directly to, to Tibet. So particularly in 8th century, it started to take root in Tibet. And from there, from there, it went to say the whole Himalaya belt. Well, now what we see as Lada, Sikkim, then Arunachal, all these modern belts. They, they say um, the Lahul, Spiti, Kinoar, and all these places. Um, this is the modern belt. And then on the Mongolia, mainly Mongolia, Tibet, Mongolia, then the Himalayan belt. So this is the, the Mahana Buddhism in Tibet and how that flourished. Then the Theravada Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism, of course, it was as early as at the time of King Ashoka. King Ashoka, he sent his son and, and his daughter to Sri Lanka and to different places, the neighboring countries. Exactly, yeah. Um, say the in the neighboring countries of India, they, that King Ashoka's son and daughter were sent to disseminate um, Buddhism there in the various places. That is the Theravada Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism. Now, the Buddhism which survives today is the Buddhism primarily in Sri Lanka, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and so more in these areas. One. The next one is the next one is the Buddhism, the Chinese Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism in China, in Japan, Korea, part of Vietnam, and then the Tibetan Buddhism, Tibet, Mongolia, then all the all the places in the Himalayan Belt. So this is what is left now. Some of you may be wondering why some of them are known as Hima, the word Mahayana. Why others are known as Theravada? Why not Buddhism is one? This is a major question, oftentimes coming to us when we are more new to Buddhism. So here, the understanding is that the teaching of the Buddhism, teaching of the Buddhism can be classified into two. Teaching of Buddhism can be classified into two, depending on the audience. Audience, when they ask, when they ask the Buddha, when they ask the Buddha, um, to say, give advice, how to help myself. And some people they come there, they go to, they they approach the Buddha and ask for, ask, how can I deal with my anger? How can I deal with my life? How can I? How? What should I think when I am dying? One. Then. Uh, and the class of people, they go to the Buddha, approach the Buddha and ask, well, we have a problem in our community. We have a problem, our community has a problem with another community. So the enlightened one, please give us advice. 
that help resolve these problems. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? One, one class of people, they approach Buddha and ask for what? Please teach me how to deal with my anger. Please teach me how to deal with my sadness. Please teach me how to uh, cope well with, uh, with my neighbors. Like this. One. The end of the class of people, they approach the Buddha and ask for, our community has a problem. Not I have a problem. My community has a problem. And my community has a problem with another community. So please advise us how to resolve this problem. Do you see the difference? One for oneself and one for the community. There are two. So which is larger in terms of the scope, in terms of the scope of the, the thought, which is more expensive, the, the individual or the, the community? Of course, the community. So the one, the, the, the teaching which the Buddha gave in order to deal with, in order to help the community. So the, the scope of the thinking, the scope of the, the teaching is for a larger interest, larger, large, in Sanskrit is maha, maha. Yan, yana is the vehicle, vehicle or a system, a system meant for larger growth, larger interest. So that is Mahayana. So other side is known as, because the other side is focused on the individual, personal, I. How should I deal with my anger? How should I deal with my depression? How can I deal with my this problem, that and so forth? This is more focused on the personal. Personal. So therefore it is known as the hin. Hinna has a connotation of the small, small vehicle. Now, the Hinayana, this word, is not encouraged to be used because this turns out to be very offensive. So therefore now this is not used. Instead we use the word Theravada nowadays. Theravada. And now precisely his holiness, his holiness is in using the word, the say the Buddhism in the Pali tradition. Buddhism Pali tradition referring to the Theravada tradition. Buddhism in Sanskrit tradition referring to the Mahayana tradition. So this is the, the distinction. Okay. With this, the point that I like to share with you here is that this whole this genre of lamrim, lamrim meaning this teaching, technically referred to as the, the 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 stages of the path, stages of the path, lamrim. So this lamrim became so popular in Tibet. This genre of the teaching, this genre of lamrim, lamrim teaching became so popular in Tibet. But this genre of teaching of Lamrim was totally absent in India. Not only today, was totally absent even before the advent of Buddhism in Tibet. Even while Buddhism was flourishing, thriving in India, in Nalanda, Vrikrama Shila, Uttarapuri, the Takshashila, and then in both the Bodh Gaya. So the Buddhism was thriving, but the genre of Lamrim was not as popular in India. It became so popular in Tibet. You may be wondering why. So what exactly is the difference? Because the Buddhism in India was the original Buddhism. Buddhism in India was the, India was the original Buddhism then, not today. Then it was the original Buddhism. It was the original form. And if something is missing there, then how can that be so popular in a foreign country? Okay, so this question. For this, we need to know that when we study this, when we study this text, you will get you will get a great deal of clue, great deal of clue as to what is Lamrim Lamrim practice, what is Lamrim teaching, what is Lamrim, which was not so popular in India then. While Buddhism was at its peak in India, but Lamrim practice, Lamrim teaching, the genre, this genre of the Lamrim was not popular in, in, in India then. Then the question arises, when was this teaching on Lamrim, when was this started? This is the question. It was not initiated by a Tibetan scholar. It was not, any, it was not the effort or the initiation the initiated by the Tibetan scholars. It was done by one Indian great saint scholar, 
guess who? Adisha Dipankara Shrijana. Adisha Dipankara Shrijana, the 11th century, incredibly great saint scholar. He was in Tibet. He was invited to Tibet in 11th century AD. He was invited to Tibet. And how is he invited? How is he invited? Okay, so today is going to be more like intro, introduction. So these things would be helpful. How was invited? Was that, and the details, details, mm, I can't really, if I, if I want to go through the details, then it may take me another like at least two, three, four sessions on this as to the how the Atishyate Bhagavad how he started to write this, this the, the text on Lamrim for the first time. So to make it the, in its just form, in its just form, what happened was that the Halama issue, there were two descendants of the Tibetan emperor descendants of the lineage Tibetan the dynasty the emperor the, the dynasty of the Tibetan the emperors there were two the, the two descendants one the uncle and the other one was the nephew uncle was Halama Ishiya Halama Halama is more like the word of reverence reverence given respect Halama because being the descendant of the kings Halama Ishiya was the uncle Ishiya and Halama Changju Changju was the nephew. And Halama Ishiya, because the, the Tibetans, the, the Buddhism, Buddhism, till say 7th century, 8th century, 7th, 8th, then say 8th century was the peak, the peak of the thriving Buddhism in Tibet. And then suddenly, suddenly it declined because of a problem with one problematic king, one problematic king um, who just assassinated um, the, a, a religious king and then the, the devilish king. Devilish king, he took over the power and then the whole Buddhism simply was crushed. Uh, and it remained like this for like 300 years. Then only in 11th century, 11th century, then the, the descendant of the, the Tibetan, the, the emperors, the two descendants, Halame Shiyu, Halame Chanjiu, particularly Halame Shiyu, the uncle, he was so, he, he, he put such an effort to try to revive Buddhism in Tibet, to revive Buddhism in Tibet, Halame Shiyu. Then Halame Shiyu, in order to revive Buddhism in Tibet, but he was no more king be. He was, of course, he was highly respected by the people around as a descendant of the king, the, the Tibetan, the royal family. But of course, he does not have any political authority so far. So he put his own. He put so much effort to look for resources, the like gold and so forth, in order to invite very authentic standard teachers from India. And in his mind. It was Adisha Devankara Shirikyana who he was intending to invite. And in the process, this Halama issue, he was, when he was going in search of gold resources in the other kingdoms nearby, uh, one of the kings of the nearby kingdom, he arrested, captured Halama Ishi and imprisoned him. And then his nephew, Halama Changjubu, he was so keen to release his uncle and of course, he having some influence in Tibet, in Tibet, and he was also a very tough, tough young man, Lama Changju, the, the nephew. So he went to meet his uncle there in the prison, and then because the, the nephew knew that his uncle was very, very compassionate, religious, not at all in favor of war, not at all in favor of any form of violence. So he, the nephew went there and told the uncle that, uncle don't worry, I'll make sure that you're released. And I went to, to talk to the, uh, talk to the king of this local, uh, local, the empire, 
kingdom and I'm going to talk to him and he's asking for the size of the, the, the gold as this, the, this, the same size as that of the uncle's body. So this was what he said and then he said that otherwise there is no need for me to give any gold to him. I can actually wage war and I can defeat him and release you but this is totally against your wish so if I don't want to wish war I would rather the same I'll release you through other means. And the uncle was so happy. Uncle was so happy. Then imagine what the uncle said. Uncle said that uncle said that I couldn't believe my eyes. I could not believe my ears today. You were born in the English expression. You were born with the silver spoon in your mouth. In the Tibetan expression, you were born with a butter in your mouth, meaning that you were born in such a good family that you have been pampered, overly pampered by everyone, that I could not imagine that you are going to one day take the responsibility of engaging in such a noble task. Then he said that, okay, now you have done a great job. He said, so good. Now, even if you release me, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a I'm not a saint. I'm not a scholar. I can't do anything for the Dharma. So whatever gold that is gathered as a as a ransom to be paid, to be given to the to the king. So what you do is take gold to India and invite Adhijita Bhagavad Gana. For me, even if you release me, even if you if you even if you're able to release me, um, I can't contribute anything to Dharma. One. Number two, I have I'm already very old. I've only ten years more to live. I can't do anything for the Dharma. So you have already done a camera so much the gold. So why don't you take the gold? Don't even give a small piece of gold to the king, to this king. Take all the gold to India and invite the great, great venerable saints called Natishadipagarishri Gyana. This is not the message. And there are so many say very poignant uh, say the the accounts of how then Talama Changjuhe he took the initiative to invite Adishita Bhagavashiriyana from India to it was not at all easy there. It was not at all easy. Because Adishita Bhagavashiriyana was like today, for example today we have the same say like the His Holiness the Dalai Lama or His Holiness the Gandhi Tirupuche. The, the top, top scholar practitioner. He was like that in India, Adhijita Mohishirikyana. If he was to be invited to Tibet, then one, whether or not he'd be allowed, whether or not he'd be allowed to move to Tibet, one. Then number two, who is going to take, take over his position in India? These were all questions. So that way it was not at all. So, there's so many episodes there, so many episodes there, and one of which to share with you was that <coughs> was that that Halama Chang Halama Changjue now he's he had to think of a next plan. Not to release his uncle, but to invite Adishita Bangladeshana from Tibet. He had to send people, emissaries, to invite Adishita Bhagavad from India. And in India, the land, say particularly Bodh Gaya, Naranda, Virgunashala, Shila, these places, very hot place, and Tibet, freezing cold, fridge like place. So, how can the scholars come there? One. And the people who are going to invite, they're going to go from a very cold place to the hot place. And who's going to survive? All, all these logistic problems were there in his mind. And what he, what he did was that, that he was so respected. For example, you go to Mysore. So then, even today, you have the Mysore king, the descendant of Mysore king. So in the, the, if you go see around the Mysore king, Raj, what is that? What is that? The, um, Jaipur and there's another place with the same name, recently named Jaipur, huh? Jodhpur. 
So say in still some of these places have their the kings existed, but they have no more the political authority there. Uh, imagine, imagine. However, although they do not have the the, the 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 political authority, but still they are so highly respected by the people that that even though you are a great scholar, even though you are a great scholar, but the people there, local people, will respect the king more than the scholars. But what he did, what he did was that on the throne, on the throne where he used to sit, he requested um, the okay now the, the name escapes from my mind. Okay, there's one. Okay, now the names skip from my mind. There was one scholar, Tibetan scholar, who already went to India several times <clears throat> and who already knew in Hindi. So I, I already lived in India for the last like, 40, more than 40 years. Still, I don't speak Hindi. Terrible. Little Hindi, my terrible. Hindi is terrible. Okay, so but they went to India for like just three, four, five years and they learned thorough Hindi, Sanskrit. They came back to Tibet and to the initiative of translating texts and so forth there. <coughs> I think those of Lundeshira, I think so. So the scholar was put on the throne and the king, the center of the king, Halamishu, he sat as a student. Then Halamishu, he made prostrations to the scholar. Otherwise, he is very unconventional, very unconventional. He made prostration, he made prostrations to the scholar sitting on the throne and then he pleaded, he pleaded the scholar, please lead, lead the group, lead the small group of the, the young boys to, to go to India and invite Adesha Debangara Shirikyana. And then this scholar, this scholar, he could imagine how terribly hot and there was no aeroplane, there was no bus, there were no cars, taxis, none of these existed. You have to walk, you have to walk all the way there. You have to take your own food, take whatever requirements, you have to take them on your own back. So these scholars, the moment they think about flashback of the experience of the early travels to India, simply make them like going to trauma trauma they would say no sir i cannot go there no sir i cannot go there so they could not accept it because it's such a traumatic experience the weather wise then the situation and then on the way on the on the road highways highways so many burglars you have to confront the huge ferocious rivers you have confront, confronted with the wild animals, confronted with the burglars, the thieves, and so forth. But the the Halamai Chanjuyan, he made more prostrations, made more, more prostrations, and um, he was crying. Literally, he started to cry. Literally, he started to cry. And he said that, otherwise, I would not make prostrations to you. Because how the people respect me, right? Yet I'm making prostrations to you. I put you on the high throne because of my respect, because of my concern for the dharma, the incredibly compassionate teaching of the Buddha Shakyamuni. I'm doing this. I'm not a scholar. I don't know anything about dharma. And you are a scholar. You know everything about dharma. You know the importance of the dharma. You know how important it is to benefit the sentient beings. You know this. Still, I'm taking responsibility, so I'm making a request to you. Please take the lead of this group to invite Atisha Dipangara Shirikyan. He made the he made this request so fervently, and finally, the 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 the, trans, the, the, Lozawa, the great scholar, he accepted. Okay, now another so many other anecdotes in between. I'll just cut it short. Now, they started the journey from Tibet. Journey. And then just crossed all these 
the you've got your snow mountains, very terribly freezing cold, crossed, and then many died on the road, on the way, and then reached India into India, very ferocious rivers they had to cross, and the bubblers at one point for the night they spent in one small place small place away next to the, the river. They could not cross the river because it was night. So they slept there. They slept there. Right. Then what happened was that, that suddenly somebody came and just shook them all, told them that you are not supposed to be sleeping here. This is my land. How dare did you sleep here? They had to all rush away. Just see what to do. Now it is totally dark. They couldn't do anything. And then Suddenly, in the river, they could hear the sound of the water splashing, water splashing, and somebody was reciting mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, in a boat. And the boatman came and said, What are you doing? So they said, We can't stay here. In the night, how come that you would be elsewhere? And then they said that, Would you mind please taking us to the other, other side of the river? Then he accepted. He accepted. He was reciting Om Mani Padme Hum, right? Okay, now, why I'm sharing this part of the story is that, is that, who is that person who shook all, all these people, who shook them up, who, who woke them up, who was that person? This place actually happened to be the place dominated by the burglar. No doubt they were all going to be killed by the burglars. So this person who woke them up was the emanation of one great saint who we are going to learn later. Great saint who in turn is a manifestation of Arya Avalokiteshvara. Tumtum Geve Jume. He was the manifestation of Dumdi Geve Jumne, who was a Tibet, in Tibet. He was actually a manifestation. Dumdi Geve Jumne was the manifestation of Aravalakiti's Buddha of Compassion. So he sent his manifestation, emanation, to wake them up, to make sure that they don't sleep here. And then who was there coming in the, the boat as the, the boatman was also his manifestation. Manifestation. He was reciting what? Om Mani Padme Hum. What is Om Mani Padme Hum? Is the is the name name of Arya Bhadrakteshvara, right? So they were all rescued, but they thought that they thought that oh this person was so unkind. They, even this person did not allow us to sleep here in the night. But they were actually saved by this person, and then finally they reached Nalanda. They reached Nalanda. In Nalanda, there was one. They met one old. Oh, elderly men, and the elderly men, seeing, seeing them as very different, they dress very different from the Indians, they asked them, you're from where? They said, we, we are Tibetans. And you came for what? And they said that, we came to invite Adisha Tibetan Shri Jnana. So the, the, the elderly men said that Tibetans do not have a knot, not, you know, a knot. Tibetans do not have a knot at their throat. And then he disappeared. What is the meaning? Tibetans don't know how to keep secret, how to keep things confidential. Right? So if you say that we are going to invite Adish Dimakara Shirjana, no, it's impossible they can invite him because then everybody is going to know about it. Then nobody is going to let Adish Dimakara Shirjana leave, leave India. So the elderly man, who was he? He is the emanation of Namdengyave Jume to tell them. Be careful, don't spill the beans. Don't let the, the confidentiality come out. Okay, then they were actually in the Narendra Monastery then. Narendra Monastery, there was one very young, very young monk. Young boy, very young monk. Came there and very curiously asked him, asked him, where are you from? We are Tibetans. What for have you come here? We came to invite Adish Dibhavarishir Jnana. Again, this, the boy said the same thing. The Tibetans do not have a knot at the thought that he disappeared. Right? Okay. So, now, 
if they were not to disclose that they came to invite Adisha Dibangara Sharikyana, how were they going to know who was Adisha Dibangara Sharikyana in the first place before they invited him? They could not even identify Adisha Dibangara Sharikyana. They could not even identify him. So many days passed, it was so hard, the situation was so bad. They could not, they were just strangers. And then they could not even, let alone invite him Adisha Dibangara Sharikyana. They could not even identify him. Right? So one day whatever has happened, the this oh no yeah the what the the scholar's name is the scholar's name was Nasulazawa. Nasulazawa. So Nasulazawa then he was the, 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 the head of the, the group. So one day he was just sitting away, all the months passed by. He was sitting there and he was reciting Har Sutra by heart in Sanskrit. And all the monks they passed by, all the monks passed by. Finally, one monk stopped and told him and commanded that you are a Tibetan, but you how you pronounce, how you recite heart, the Sanskrit, how you recite heart, Sanskrit, no, heart sutra and Sanskrit, it's just amazing, it's fabulous. But you are making a very small mistake in this pronunciation. He corrected. The monk corrected. And the one left. Then this Nasul Sawa, the great Tibetan scholar, uh, after all these months of journey, all these the the, the turbulations, coming there and going with not not being able, even able uh, to identify Adishita Bhagavashiyana, he became so desperate. Then he told himself, he told himself. Never mind, we can't even identify Adishit Dibhagavashrikyan, never mind. If we cannot, I, I, we cannot invite him, I can invite this monk. One, he's very scholarly. Number two, he's very compassionate. Because all these monks passed by, they heard me reciting this. But nobody stopped. Only this monk stopped. He's very compassionate. And he's very learned. So I'll invite him. It doesn't matter. Even if Adishit Dibhagavashrikyan couldn't be invited, we'll invite him. So this was... And later on, of course, I'll skip all the other details. Later on, when they finally met Adisha Dibhagavad Shrikyana, that monk who stopped by to correct him was Adisha Dibhagavad Shrikyana himself. Right? Okay. So, Adisha Dibhagavad Shrikyana, finally, okay, there were so many interesting things. Then he was invited to Tibet, invited to Tibet with all the difficulties. Finally, one night they met, they could not meet in the daytime. They met confidentially, secretly, they met one night. Then they made the formal request to Adisha Dibhagavashirigyana to come to Tibet at the invitation of the Tibetan, the, the king, descendant of a king. <coughs> then Adisha Dibhagavashirigyana said one day, for a foreign Indian scholar, for an Indian scholar to come to Tibet in those days, for to come to Tibet, they should be Two reasons. One, one, the scholar, the same, the, the scholar must have a great feeling of compassion, great feeling of compassion for the people there, and could foresee, could foresee the enormous benefit the people are going to, to acquire from his going there. One, from that point of view. I don't see myself in this position. I don't see myself as going to be of tremendous benefit for the Tibetans in Tibet. One. Number two, the scholars, some scholars, they were there to acquire gold, right? In order to get gold, they go to Tibet and see something, they get gold, to acquire gold. And for me, I have no passion, I have no desire for gold. So from these two point of view, then I don't see any reason why I should be invited there to Tibet. And then he said, but, but I see two things with Tibetans. One, I feel so compassionate towards the Tibetan people overall because they are so committed, they are so committed, dedicated, and tremendous devotion to the Dharma. So from this, I have a compassion one. 
because he could see that all these people, they came not from the flight to flight last night and came to Delhi today. It's not like that. Months and months of toils that they go through. Went through, one. Number two, he said that Halama Ishi, the uncle, the uncle who died in the prison, even she died there. Halama Ishi, Halama Ishi, who was the key person to invite me? In fact, he was a great, great Bodhisattva. And if I don't go to Tibet, I commit a heinous crime of breaching the advice of a Bodhisattva. So he said that if I don't go to, to Tibet, then I breach the advice, the instruction of a Bodhisattva. So I commit tremendous negative karma. So he's a great Bodhisattva. For these two reasons, I see that there is a need for me to come to Tibet. So this was, and there were so many other things happening. So this is how he went. Then, after he went there, okay, so this is more like story sharing. He went there, then what happened was that, was that, okay. Okay, there are so many digressions. Okay, now the Indians, how the, the Indians, the Tibetans see the Indians in those days. Do you hear that? Right? Okay. Um, okay. I think today is more like story sharing. Are you good? There are so many of these anecdotes. I can't finish all. One was that Okay. Okay, now let me be very direct. Mm. Let me be very direct. Like a person like a me, let me say, can, can I go to Tibet? Yes, yes, why not? <laughs> then what is wrong with Naima? He can't go. Huh? That boy can't go, go to Tibet, why? That's different. That's all. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Now, Adishadi Bhagavad Shri Gyana. Adishadi Bhagavad Shri Gyana, his mentor in India finally gave permission to Adishit Devangarishi Gyana and the Tibetans to invite Adishit Devangarishi Gyana to Tibet only for three years. So the mentor, mentor's name I forgot, the mentor, Adishit Devangarishi Gyana's mentor, so said that you can, you can Invite him, you can take him to Tibet, but only for three years. After three years, you make it a point that Adishite Bhagavad Gyan is back to India. This was the deal. Now, Adishite Bhagavad Gyan was already in Tibet for three years. Then, there was a clash happening between two groups. The group who were involved in inviting Adishite who went to India to invite Adishite Bhagavad Gyan, and the group who was there in Tibet itself, two groups, the students, among the students of Adishya Devgana Shri Gyana. So, the group, the ones in Tibet, Tibet who were not involved in the, 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 this invitation. So they were saying that, oh Adishya Devgana Shri Gyana, please don't leave Tibet, please stay in Tibet. And the group who were invite, invited, they already made a promise that after three years will be because they also received teachings from his mentor also. So his, they were students of his mentor. His mentor said that if you don't bring him after three years, then our teacher-student relationship is severed. <laughs> this is the, the deal. So the, those involved in the invitation, invited Adishit Devgarashirigyana, they were saying that now the master Adishit Devgarashirigyana, it's your time to leave for India, right? And then at that point when Adishadeep Garashiriyan was heading towards India, had to cross, um, cross Nepal, there was a war happening in Nepal. And Adishadeep Garashiriyan uh, told the, the group the in, involved with inviting him, I said, don't worry, don't worry. It is the message, it is the, the message of the Buddha, Buddha, that at times, even though we made commitments, we made commitments, but 
If it is beyond our hand, then you are exempted. So we do not need to worry. Then what happened? That at least the information must be sent to India that there was a war happening in Nepal so that they could not cross the Nepal to India. So Adishit uh, Rishi Yaman, he started to send uh, the messenger to India. And meanwhile, he composed this Lumbran text. This Lumbran text, he composed, right? Not this one, not this one. I'm going to share more. The Lumbran text, he composed, and then sent that as a gift, as a consolation, as a consolation, as a gift to his mentor and to all the scholars in Nalanda. In Nalanda, um, it was sent. And then finally, Right? His mentor in Nalanda and all the scholars there in Nalanda seeing this small book written by Adishadeh Bhangarashi Gyana, which is known as um, the same in Tibetan, London. London means the lamp of the path, path of enlightenment. Lamp of the path of enlightenment, the light. London. L light or the lamp of path enlightenment. In, in Sanskrit, Bodhi, Bodhipat Pradi, London, Bodhipat Pradi. Yeah, this is the text. Then all the scholars there in India, they saw this text. They were so mesmerized, baffled. They were so happy. They were so excited to see the book, see the book here, and they imagined. What they said, what they said was that we are so grateful to, we are so grateful to Atisha Debangari Shri Gyanam or the Tibetans. All the scholars were saying that we are so grateful to the Tibetans. We are so grateful to the Tibetans. Had it not been the case that, had it not been the case that he was in, he is in Tibet, he would not write this book. And this book is a great, great, great legacy. It's an incredible masterpiece. We cannot possibly see this treasure exist in the world, in this universe. Had it not been the case that he left for Tibet, it's wonderful, it's amazing. Because he was in Tibet then, that the Tibetans could not fulfill the commitment to, come, to bring it back. Now this is coming. It's because of the Tibetans that we are getting this treasure. This is a big, big treasure, we thanks to the Tibetans. Then instantly a message was sent back, saying that now you can live in Tibet as many years as you like. Because we all already got this treasure, it's a big, big gift for us, from you. It's all because of the, the kindness of the Tibetans for keeping him there. Because Adishadibhagar Shirikyan was so humble, a great scholar, but very humble, that he would not write a text. Had it been the case that he was in India, he would never write a text. Because that he was in, in Tibet and he has to do something to make the people there happy, so just he wrote it. Oh, so therefore this is a great treasure. This is what, this is the greatest thing that we can expect from him. So okay, so this text. So that is the initial book, initial but which is a part of the whole genre of Lambre, right? So it started from the 11th century by Adishet Dipangari Shri Gyana. So this text became so popular in Tibet, in Tibet, and then, say, in 11th century, the same time as Adishet Dipangari Shri Gyana was Jesu Marpa, Jesu Mila, all the great, the, 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 the gurus in the tradition of Kaju, Kaju, and then way before that was from the Yingma, all the great masters were here. And then around the same time, psyche tradition also evolved. So besides Gilu tradition, all other Tibetan Buddhist traditions already existed at that time. And all these traditions, Nyingma, Sakya, Kaiku, they were all studying his texts as the main, as the, the final judgment, as the final preamble, as the final constitution of the, the, the Dharma practice, philosophy and the practice. So this became like this, it became so popular. And then so many commentaries started to be written 
on the basis of this text. On the basis of this text, by the scholars from protecting traditions in Ma Gaiyu Sakya Oma. And then in 11th, no, 14th century AD, 14th century AD, then the author of the text which we are studying, Lama Tsongkhapa, he appeared. He appeared and said his tradition, Lama Tsongkhapa's tradition, is considered as the, the revival. Adish Dibingara's tradition came to be known as the Kadamba tradition. Kadamba tradition. Adish Dibingara Shirikyana's tradition. Kadamba tradition. So they were already existing uh, Tibetan traditions were Nyingma, Sakya, Kayu, all three were existing then. And then Adish Dibingara Shirikyana's one is there, that was the, the Kadamba tradition. Then in 14th century, about like 300 years later, 14th century, then uh, the Lama Tsongkhapa appeared. Lama Tsongkhapa, he was the 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 one who was who continued the tradition of the the Adishadevanga and because he combined Adishadevanga tradition with Aryanagarjuna's philosophy and many other philosophy, so that totality of the tradition which was which was which evolved from Lama Tsongkhapa is known to be known as New Kadamba tradition. New Kadamba tradition. Now, in the 21st century, there is a complication. In the 21st century, there is a complication. Now, if you go to America, particularly in America, in the West, you will see NKT. NKT means N for New, K for Kadamba, T for tradition. It's very confusing now. Lama Tsongkhapa's tradition is known as New Katama tradition, Katam Sarma. Adisha Dibingara's tradition is known as Katam Nyingma, the old Katama tradition. Our old Katama tradition and Katam Sarma is just the same. Same. Only thing, only thing is that Lama Tsongkhapa, he added, he brought all the rich philosophy of Arunigarjuna, all these things, into Lamrim. That became the Katam Sarma, the new tradition. Now, in the West, there's one very controversial tradition which came into existence. In English, precisely in English, is known as NKT. So don't mix up the two things. Don't mix up the two things. NKT, is very, NKT today, today is very controversial. Right? That's very different tradition. It's not the it's not the exact the, the traditional Lama Tsongkhapa is a it's a new thing, it's a different thing. So this we are not a mix of the, the, Can the we compare it with Old Testament and New Testament or something like that? Yes, so we have to study this first. We have to study this. So we we can be free to compare compare among the different traditions. For example, Old Testament, New Testament, Gita then the yeah. Quran, you know, and then this text we can compare. So for this we need to know the text. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, now this is the perfect juncture. This perfect this question is the perfect juncture to connect between today's class and next Friday's class. The question is if Lamrim is something so precious, how Indian even the Indian masters, Indian masters, contemporary, those contemporary of the contemporary with Adishana. Shirgyana. They admired so much. Why did it not exist? Why did well? Why it did not? Why was it not existent pre Adishadevanga Shirgyana? Why did it come only at the time of Adishadevanga Shirgyana? This is a question, right? Okay. So this we will do in the next class. Okay. We'll stop here. Now, quick dedication prayer. Page three zero nine. 
With a wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge to the Triple Gem. I confess the negativities individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. I hold the precious Buddha in my heart. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. A part of union of emptiness and compassion is loosely explained by the protector of the Dharma and the beings from the snow land. You are the Lord's soul that tends in Yasu. We supplicate you that your wishes are fulfilled spontaneously. May the operations of evil thoughts and deeds of the negative forces of humans or non humans, who have a malice through perverted prayers against the teachings of the Buddhas, be truly vanquished through the power of the truth of the rituals. Throughout my future lifetimes, may I always be guided by Ramaji Shri and be able to uphold the Dharma in general and the teachings of dependent origination in particular, even in the course of my life. Okay, so the basic plan that we have is that, so this is a very comprehensive text, very comprehensive text, and the, the root text, the root text of this, uh, which is Adishita Bhagavan Shri Gyanas, um, uh, the, the text in Tibetanese, London, and uh, the, in Sanskrit is in Bodhi, Bodhi, Bodhi Bad Pradi, okay. So the, the, the land of the body enlightenment, Bodhi So this is a very comprehensive text. So as a part, as a part of the Tibet House program, the Buddhist program, to do the introduction to Buddhism. All the topics which we covered in the earlier many years, topics of the introduction to Buddhism, like karma, like the three times will of dharma, or like the bodhicitta, the, the steps of the Buddhist practice, then the wisdom of emptiness, and so for all these topics, samsara, nirvana, what is the Buddha nature, and say the the um, rails about the karmas and about the say the um, the, the the three higher trainings, three higher trainings and the uh, Siddhipatthana Sutra, all these the, the topics which we covered the last many years. Um, I'm thinking of doing all these things one more related to this text. So where necessary, we go to detail. So this text, study this text, we can finish this in two days, but uh, because that is going to be into, it's going to be like the, the main umbrella um, with which we could explain the, all the introductory topics of Buddhism. So this will take many more days. Okay, um, to, what do you call, what do you call that? It's a blur and like a same, um, a, say a synopsis, a very quick synopsis to connect to the next class is to the question which Badriji is asking. I don't know whether Badriji will be here at the next class. So therefore I'll quickly give an answer here. Okay. Is that, um, is that, that in Tibet, in Tibet, for the Buddhist, Buddhist practice, Buddhist teachings, Buddhist teachings, besides the, the native Tibetan religion, there were no competitors. You understand it? In India, they were so India was so rich in the philosophical traditions. Right? Already, even at the time of the Buddhist Shakyamuni, there were at least like five, at least five major five major philosophical traditions already existed at the time of the Buddha, which are all, some of them are similar, but they were all different, different philosophical traditions. So there was so much of competition amongst themselves. So intellectual competition, not just, you know, fighting because of your religion is different from mine, fighting, not like this. Intellectual competition, there were debates going there. Because of this competition, such a, teaching of the Lamrim, Lamrim was not as required 
not as required because with this rich philosophical discussion happening between different traditions, people already become so evolved. People already become so evolved. For example, like say, uh, let us say, um, let us give the example of, say, um, crash course, right? What's the difference between the crash course and the buckle course? What's the difference? Crash course is not for the experts. Crash course is for the amateurs. For the experts, they don't need the crash course. So this one is more like a crash course. Lamrev is a crash course. Tibetans, they don't need to debate with other people. Right? They just, they were so devout. Indians, Indians in those days, not today, today I'm not too sure. In those days, Indians, they were already, all these traditions were there. So rigorously, they were debating amongst each other. They were evolving intellectually. Intensely evolving because of the contribution from each other. Mutual the evolution is happening. Whereas in Tibet, it's only one sided. So just give a crash course, and Tibet, Tibet will follow it and will directly achieve enlightenment. But how many achieve enlightenment? Only one example, which is Milarepa. Right? Okay. Well, of course, the author of the text, author of the text, Amatsungapa. He achieved enlightenment. He reached the last stage in this in his very life, and then the moment uh, he passed away, he left this body. What the ordinary beings take as what is known as a pardo state, intermediate state, he achieved enlightenment. Okay. Of course, there are so many examples, instances of the Tibetans having achieved enlightenment, but in a very prominent, in a very obvious way. Is the of the just Malarpa. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. The Indians were already so intellectually advanced and spiritually advanced when they received the number of teachings. How come they appreciated it so much? Because for them it was a very basic thing. Because Adishadev Bhungara Shri Jana, he got the opportunity to see the Tibetan side. Indians, they saw only the Indian side. They did not see that there is someone who will just follow, follow the instructions verbatim, right? Who will not question. Whereas Adishadev Bhungara Shri Jana, he got the audience, which is very different from the Indians, right? The audience who would be so eager to follow you directly or follow the word word. Okay. Okay. So this is what we're going to continue. So this is going to be a series of classes happening. Okay, good night.